without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our topic tonight, One Health, Animals, Humans, and the Environment. When we put together the sessions, we were really excited about this, this evening. It was around the time that people were worried about Ebola, and there are a number of things happening within the environment over the last five years where we're seeing this interaction of animals with humans, and I think this evening's uh, speakers will il really elucidate this topic nicely. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Peter Rabinovitz. He's Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Services and Global Health at the University of Washington School of Medicine and Public Health. He's an adjunct professor in allergy and infectious diseases, and he's director for the Center of One Health Research at the Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences um, Department here. In addition, he's director of the Canary Database, and it was exciting as I looked at introducing him tonight. You should go online and look this up yourselves. All you have to do is Google Canary Database. It's an online resource for evidence about uh, animals as sentinels of human environmental hazards. Dr. Rabinowitz's uh, research interests include uh, zoonoses, which are infectious diseases between animals and humans, animals as sentinels, and increasing collaborations between human healthcare providers and veterinarians. He's co-editor of the clinical manual, Human Animal Medicine, Zoonoses, Toxicants, and Other Shared Health Risks. And he was a visiting scientist at the World Health Organization and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. He earned his medical degree from the University of Washington, completed a family medicine residency at the University of California, San Francisco in their Salinas program, and he's completed fellowships in general preventative medicine and occupational environmental medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. So we're thrilled to have him uh, speak tonight. Thank you so much, Susan. It's great to be here. It's my first time at the Mini Medical School. Um, as Susan said, I went to the, uh, the medical school here, but this is a great experience and it's really great to be part of this. And tonight I think it's really going to be a lot of fun for you because there's a number of different people talking about different aspects of this One Health idea, which is all about the connections between the health of humans as well as the health of animals and the environment and how all these connections are really becoming more and more important. So the One Health idea really stresses how these connections are, are affecting the, the daily health of us and when we go to the doctor, um, how possibly the doctor might want to know more about our other relationships with things like animals in our house or the animals outside where we are or how we relate to the environment and some things about our health risk really could be important about that, both in terms of things that could make us sick and ways that we can be healthy. So as Susan said, one of the ideas about doing this program was that certain diseases come from animals, and you're going to hear a lot about that tonight. Um, these are called zoonoses, and we'll talk more about that, things like Ebola. And before that, there's a disease called MERS and a disease called SARS that you've heard about that are really, these are animal diseases that are now crossing into people. And why is that? What's happening to make this more jumps from animals to people than used to happen before. Um, and how do we start working between animal health and human health and environmental health to figure out what these connections are and what to do about it? And as Susan also said, sometimes animals can really help us in ways like being the canary in the coal mine for problems in the environment where if an animal gets sick, maybe that's a sign that there's something in the environment that could be making us sick as well and we should pay more attention when animals are getting sick and not just say, that's the animals, it doesn't relate to us as humans. So we're gonna talk about some of these connections and again, you'll hear more about it. When medical school, we study pathology as one of the, as one of the key sort of disciplines in medicine where we learn about what happens to different tissues and different parts of the body. And the father of modern pathology was a scientist in Germany named Rudolf Virchow in the 1800s. And he really made most of his discoveries by studying diseases in animals. And he really said, you know, there's so many similarities between the way that animals get sick and the way that people get sick 
that there really should be no dividing line between human medicine and animal medicine, and that's really the way it should be. But that was a, a while ago, and as medicine developed and medical education and research developed, um, we started building silos between the human health world and the world of animals and the veterinarians and uh, what happens there, and then also things in the environment and environmental science. And we sort of said, well, this is a human health issue, or this is an animal health issue, and there's no connection, or this is an, something out in the environment, and it's really not going to affect either one. And I think these silos were probably a bad idea, but just to give you an example, many of the Medical schools in the country were built in cities where a lot of people lived, where the large hospitals were, where all the human health was going on, whereas the veterinary schools were often built uh, in areas where there was a lot of agriculture going on, but maybe not as big a city and maybe um, not as many people. And as an example is in Washington State, we have a wonderful medical school in Seattle and obviously um, ties to places around the region, but it's really based here in Seattle, whereas the veterinary school is based across the state in Pullman at Washington State University, and it's a wonderful vet school. It's one of the top veterinary schools in the country. They have a wonderful program for animal health and often have some overlaps with human health and what they do, but they're very far away. And, and so this has happened in many other states in the country where we're just sort of separated between what the veterinarians are learning and what the human health people are learning. So when I went to medical school here, I didn't have contact with any veterinary students or meet any veterinarians during, during medical school. And so it's wonderful tonight to be sharing the podium here with a veterinarian in Seattle and all the connections, but that didn't happen when I was in school. So now that as we look at these connections of One Health, we have to bring these communities that were in silos together, and often we have to reach out across a distance in a place like Washington State, as, I, as we'll talk about. And um, why are we now thinking more and more about these connections about people and animals and, and the environment coming together? One reason is that we're all on the same planet together and it's becoming a more crowded planet. So we all know that the human population, which has really increased several billion over the past several decades, is continuing to increase. And there's just less resources for everyone and it's, and it's just a problem with food and water and things like that. So this is the curve, this is sort of the line here of the human population increasing over the past several decades. But many of us, certainly in a city or in human health, um, don't always think about the fact that other animal, there are animal populations that are increasing even faster than humans and this is the world population of chickens. So in 1960, there were about the same number of chickens in the world as people. So there were several billion people and several billion chickens. But as you can see what's happened since 1960, the number of chickens in the world uh, has really exploded so that there's really, at any one point now, about 25 billion chickens in the world. And when you compare that to the rise in humans, so the, the people line there in the middle is, is sort of, you can see a in steady increase in human population, but the, you can really appreciate how many more chickens there are in the world. And the reason we're having so many chickens is because people, as they get a little more income, as, as standards of living rise around the world, one of the first things people wanna do is eat a little more protein and increase more animal protein in their diet. If we were all vegetarians, it probably wouldn't be an issue, but um, for a long time, we're gonna continue probably to rely on animal protein for feeding a lot of the world. And so there are simply gonna be more animals as we increase our human population over the next couple of decades, there's gonna be a lot more animals too. And that's something we have, again, you know, sharing this planet with a lot more animals than we ever have before. This really never has happened before. And you can see that really in the last several decades, this is where the increase has happened. And this is causing all sorts of potential problems because if there's a disease outbreak in the animals like bird flu, then there's plenty of chance for that to spread through a big chicken population and also possibly spread to humans. Even outside these sort of big farms where there may be a lot of chickens, if you think about the, the five or six billion people in the, in the world at any one time, about a billion of them are actually involved working closely with animals. And if you're living in a city, you may not see that every day, but even in Seattle, think about the people who are starting to raise uh, chickens in their backyard for, for eggs, 
or you can have a goat in Seattle if you really want. And there's a lot of people who have animals one way or another. But if you think about the whole world, a lot of people still work very closely with animals and have that kind of contact. And even um, away from raising for food, animal-human contact is thought to have a lot of psychological benefits. That's why we're bringing visiting dogs into a place like Children's, uh, Children's Hospital here in Seattle because it really seems to help the kids who are very stressed out with an illness to spend a little time patting a dog or being close to an animal. And so this human-animal bond is, is an incredibly positive thing, but again, there's also potential risks from having such close contact with animals. And again, here's some people in the Northwest who are raising chickens and having a lot of time. Uh, these people actually are, are, are chicken sitting. So if you go on vacation, these people will take care of your chickens <laughs> for you. <clears throat> and one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, uh, according to the veterinarians I've talked to, there are actually more dogs in Seattle than children. And um, so it's a very common thing for people to have an animal as part of the family. And then to be taking that animal to a veterinarian and finding out that, um, lo and behold, the medical care that you can get for an animal in a, in a place like Seattle is very similar to the kind of medical care that you can get for a human. Uh, the, you can have, as you're seeing here, a cat getting a CAT scan. Um, <laughs> and lots of, you can have, cancer treatments for your animal. You can have both chemotherapy and radiation therapy. You can have all sorts of surgery. The, it's, a, it's a highly sophisticated development of the technology for animals that has um, been developing with the technology for humans. And, and you'll hear tonight about some of the exchange of medical techniques and technology between a place like the School of Medicine and a place like the Woodland Park Zoo. And I think this is really an incredible development, but think about all the dogs and cats that are also getting care and things. So with all that contact, with all the animals that we're spending a lot of time with in one way or another, even when we don't always think about it, um, and how we're sharing this planet with these animals, there's some downsides and some opportunities from a health point of view. So one of the downsides is this idea of a zoonosis. And this is, again, an infection that is originally an animal disease that is then somehow transmitted to people. And this, this term was actually coined by Rudolf Virchow, this father of pathology who was in, in Germany. Um, and it seems to be a, something that we've been having as an issue for a long time. We really think that a lot of human diseases started at around the time that we started having animals living very close with us, around the time we started domesticating animals back in the Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia thousands of years ago. And that even when you think about the, the plagues in Egypt, the uh, fifth plague was a plague actually of animal disease where the animals all developed uh, sores and started dying. And they think that was actually anthrax which is a cattle disease, but it actually, as we know, can be a bioterrorism threat and can be a serious human health disease as well. So these things have been around for a long time, but why now does it seem that if we look at the last several decades, these emerging infectious diseases, these new sort of scary diseases like Ebola, which was not discovered until 1976, and really is an animal disease that has probably lives in bats all the time and then occasionally crosses over to people. Why is this kind of disease emerging? If you think about all these diseases, about 70% of the emerging infectious diseases, the Ebola, the SARS, the MERS, the bird flu, the West Nile virus, these are, these are zoonotic diseases which are now for some reason emerging. Really, think about all the reasons why that could be. Agriculture is changing, we're raising a lot more chickens, we're raising a lot of other animals, we're on a crowded planet, we're in close contact with animals, we're deforesting the environment, there's climate change. So all this has sort of come together, which again is a reason why we need to look at these connections in a, in a, in a One Health way. So we talked about the downsides, but we're learning that um, there can be good things about contact with animals. We talked about the psychosocial benefit of spending time with, a, with an animal, um, like a kid in a hospital with a dog. But we also think that it's possible to be too clean when it comes to infections, and that our, our ancestors lived with animals like all the time for the last thousands, several thousand years. So we've really gotten used to having animals in our environment, and our bodies are sort of used to that. And if you raise a kid 
in a, in a city where there's very little contact with animals and they really don't go out very much and they don't get to sort of get the dirt that you'd get if you lived on a farm, there's some evidence that too much hygiene can actually increase your rate of something like allergies. We don't quite understand that well, but we think that some of the ways that we, we are healthy or not healthy is more and more related to this thing called the microbiome, which are the trillions of bacteria that live on us all the time. So there's actually more bacteria that we carry around with than we actually have cells of our own body. And the microbiome, it turns out, is especially the microbiome in our gut, is very important for disease and keeping healthy. And it turns out that when you live closely with a dog, you start sharing a lot of germs with that dog, not all of which are bad germs. Some of these are actually good bacteria that may um, actually strengthen your immune system to have a little contact like this with the, with the dog. So there's, there's, there's a downside of maybe an infection, but maybe there's a little, you don't want to be too clean and it's okay to have a little dirt and a little animal contact sometimes. Another, another possible benefit by having exchange of information between human health and animal health is the ways, the things that we can learn from animals, not just in the traditional way of, of having an animal in a laboratory, but in sort of the new way of looking about animals as, as their own health develops in a place like a home, like a pet. So what could we learn from looking at the health of dogs living in households in Seattle? There's a group at the University of Washington that is working on a pill to make you live longer. And they think that one way to find out this pill, which seems to work in mice, if it, if it works in, to, one way to find out if it works in humans is to consider doing a clinical trial of this pill with pet dogs and having people bring in their pet dog and enroll them in this study and take this pill for several years and really see whether dogs can be sort of an intermediate step from going from basic medical research to something that really has a, has a benefit for, for humans. And so there is a project to enroll dogs um, in, a, in a longevity study that is going to be going on in Seattle if it all gets funded and worked out because dogs uh, are very similar evolutionary to humans. They share the same environment that we're in, so they're a much better sort of real world way to test out a treatment like that. And if a dog's gonna show something, remember dog years are five or six human years, right? Or something like that, so that you could actually find out if it works or not in only a couple of years and not have to wait 15 or 20 years the way you'd have to work and wait in a human trial. Um, <clears throat> and this could really show if this treatment is, is useful. So here's an idea where we work on a treatment, it's gonna actually potentially benefit dogs and then it could benefit people as well. It's a slightly different way than we've looked for treatments in the past. And the final thing that animals could do that, that really could be important for our health, again, is, is by being like the canary in the coal mine. And minor, coal miners really did used to take canaries down into coal mines to see whether there were dangerous gases in the, in the mine that would make them have to put on their emergency equipment. So in the same way, sometimes if a dog, if there's lead poisoning in a house as a risk, the dog or the cat would get lead poisoning before the people will because they're often more exposed and they're in the house all the time and they eat dirt and they just, are, they're gonna be the first ones to show the problem. And in other ways, animals in the wild getting sick can be a sign that there's something again in the environment, either an infection or a toxic hazard. And we're thinking about this with say the, blue, the, um, the orcas in, in Puget Sound, if they get sick from a chemical, then possibly there's the same kind of chemical that can make us sick. So animals can often tell us sooner and better about hazards in the environment, and we should sort of listen to that. So here at the University of Washington, we've started really the first center for One Health research in a medical school in the country to kind of explore these things. <laughs> and we're, we're gonna really try to work on the zoonotic disease problem, and you're gonna, again, hear more about this tonight from some other great people here working on this. But we think that this is maybe not such a great idea, and <laughs> we wanna find ways to help both prevent it, and if it happens, find better ways to treat these diseases. Um, but we also wanna find out you know, better ways to exchange information between human health and, and um, veterinary medicine. And you're gonna hear tonight some great exchanges um, with Dr. Davis and Dr. Collins from the Woodland Park, and about things at the Woodland Park Zoo. 
But this is at the aquarium in Seattle where some of the rockfish, you may have read about this in the newspaper, are having eye problems. And we're in discussions with the Department of Ophthalmology here at the university to help the veterinarian who's here teaching me how to, how to catch a fish um, <laughs> for treatment, actually. Um, but there's going to try to get the ophthalmologist from the university together with this doctor at the, at the, at the aquarium to work on new treatments for the, for the rockfish. And the last thing we're doing is um, finding that sometimes people care so much about their animals that they will seek care for their animals even if they're not taking as good care of themselves. And that's true of a lot of the homeless people in Seattle who you may have seen on the street with a dog or another pet where they're often giving up food for themselves so that they can keep their pet fed. And there are clinics set up for, to take care of the animals for the homeless, and we're trying to see if we can combine a human clinic to take care of the homeless people when they come in to get their pet taken care of, so they can go to one place and get their animals and themselves taken care of. And to build bridges across the state with our veterinary school at Washington State University, um, that we think it's a great thing to be building some bridges between Washington State University and the University of Washington. Um, and other groups in the state that are interested in this One Health concept. We put on a conference in November here for doctors and veterinarians to share uh, on the same conference in information about how animal and human health are related, especially when it came to the environment. And we had the Woodland Park Zoo involved and the veterinary school in, the, in Washington State University, and it was a really great success. So I'm going to really hope you enjoy the, the, the other talks with Dr. Davis talking about working at the, at the zoo with Dr. Collins and Lisa Jones Engel doing amazing things with primates in Asia and see how it all relates to this One Health concept. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Peter, I was, uh, I was very intrigued to see Burkhoff's comment about there being no difference between animals and humans. I think our veterinarians embrace that because when I get the bill for our <laughs> pets, it's no different from our own health care bills. I'm sure that's your experience too. I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to, uh, uh, to introduce our next speaker, Greg Davis. He's the um, Associate Professor of Otolaryngology. Uh, head and neck surgery here at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He's the director of rhinology and endoscopic skull-based surgery. Hopefully he'll explain all of that to you. Uh, he joined the faculty uh, in uh, 2007 and was shortly thereafter awarded a very competitive K-12 uh, NIH grant, some of which uh, the work of he will be describing today. His areas of research include chronic rhinosinusitis, olfactory loss, cystic fibrosis-related sinusitis, and national trends in chronic sinusitis surgery and autism. He's a physician educator who teaches a number of national sinus surgery courses and provides advanced training in sinus surgery techniques. He did his medical degree here at the University of Washington and completed his residency here as well, and uh, then did a two-year clinical research fellowship and master's degree in public health as well. Uh, please join me, welcome Dr. Greg Davis. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, tell a story tonight. And it's a fun story to tell. Uh, it's not just about sinus disease, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about this. So I'm an otolaryngologist, which is an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. And what I tell a lot of people is, I'm the end guy in ENT. So I don't do any ears or throats anymore, just sinus surgery, medical management of sinus and nose related diseases. So one day, I was hanging out in my office and a good friend of mine, Al Hillel, who is a laryngologist, he's the throat guy in ear, nose and throat. He is a, a gentleman who is on faculty here at the UW. And he had been volunteering with the zoo for many, many years, probably 20, 25 years. And about every five or 10 years, the zoo will call Dr. Hillel and have an ear, nose, and throat type question. And I've always admired this. In Dr. Hillel's office, he has a picture of him examining a monkey, examining a lion's ear, looking for an ear infection. And I always thought that was pretty neat. So when he called me one day and he said, Greg, I have this case for you that I need some help with. And this is a 35-year-old male with chronic sinus disease, and I'm thinking, all right, it's kind of my run of the mill, it's what I do. He says, well, we have to take a field trip to get there. 
And, and this is one of my favorite places in Seattle. Um, I grew up in Seattle. My wife and I took our kids there uh, all the time. And through the dreary winters, we used to spend a lot of time in the nice warm avian house at the Woodland Park Zoo. So I was very excited to go back. And they told me I would be meeting a gorilla. And not just a gorilla, a 430-pound Western silverback gorilla named Vip. Vip stands for a very important primate. And he is. He's the alpha male of his family. And he is a father. He is nurturing. Uh, but he's the alpha male. And when you go to meet Vip, it's a little bit intimidating. Um, there's cautionary tales such as make sure you sit down lower than he is on a little stool. Don't make eye contact. Speak in a soft, low voice. So I was already terrified before I got there. <laughs> And, and then they um, told me a little bit more about him. And Vip had been suffering from a sinus infection. And as you can see from this picture, it's a little hard to tell, but if, if we zoom in, you can see some purulence or some pus draining out of his left nostril. And, and the, the vets, headed by Dr. Darren Collins here at my left, and he'll be speaking in a little bit, uh, they did an absolutely fantastic job taking care of Vip. I don't know if any of you have ever had a sinus infection. My guess is most of you have. But they took the extra step to actually slide a culture swab into Vip's nose and figure out what the pathogen was, what the uh, antibiotic was best to treat that pathogen or bacteria was with. And very impressive. And if we could put on the volume from the computer, that would be fantastic. So this is myself and Dr. Hillel sitting down in <laughs> the behind the scenes area of the gorilla house. And this is VIP, it's a little hard to tell, but this is gorilla noise right here. And it's a happy noise from what I'm told. There are different times where he would express his anxiety or frustration or dominance, uh, but not at this first interaction. And he was really nice to us. He uh, let us get up nice and close. And now this has gone on for a few months, probably I think three or four months at this point in time. And compared to the picture before, now you can see the pus is draining out of both nostrils. So the infection is getting worse. And as I said, Dr. Collins and Dr. Helmick, the two veterinarians at the Woodland Park Zoo, excellent care. They took the time to take a culture to deliver antibiotic culture-directed therapy, meaning they tested that bacteria against a bunch of different antibiotics to figure out what the best one is to treat VIP with. And first time, he grew up Bacteroides and Moraxella, two pretty common pathogens for sinus disease, they treated him with the right antibiotic, but it continued. Then he grew out Enterobacter, and they changed antibiotics, and added some steroids, and finally grew out E. coli. E. coli is a gut pathogen. Uh, he does eat his own feces from time to time, and so it kind of makes you wonder why that happened, but there you go. Uh, so we came in, and, and Dr. Hillel and I visited the zoo, and and I, as we gathered with the animal health team and the gorilla keepers, I said, if this was a human, we would give them a few weeks of culture-directed antibiotic therapy with a fluoroquinolone like Cipro, some steroids to decrease the inflammation inside the sinus cavities, and then saline irrigations, like a neti pot. Many of you have probably done that. And in this close room, I, I suggested, I, and I said, so do you guys think you could do saline irrigations with him? And the room got very quiet. <laughs> and then one of the gorilla keepers said, how about you try it first? <laughs> so I adjusted the treatment plan. And that actually should be a cross out, not an underline. <laughs> um, unfortunately, Vip's condition took a pretty dramatic change within about a week of that. And uh, so the next step was to tr really try to figure out what is going on. We knew he had a sinus infection, but we were certainly concerned that it might have been a tumor at the same time. One of the zoo's board of directors, Dr. Dr. Robert Liddell is a radiologist. And so he generously donates his time and his radiology suite to the zoo. And from time to time, they will get CAT scans and MRIs of different zoo animals. So by traffic police escort and zoo ambulance, they took VIP from the zoo under general anesthesia to the Center for Diagnostic Imaging close to Northgate Mall. And it was quite an impressive sight. Uh, this is a picture of VIP on the CT scanner. So he's on his back. He has the breathing tube in his airway. So he's under a general anesthesia. And he's 425 pounds. And the maximum weight limit of the CT scan is right about 400. 
So it, it was hit or miss. It took a while to get the CT scan, but with Dr. Liddell's expertise, we did. Uh, and this is a picture of the first time I really thoroughly examined VIP. And in my right hand, I have a rigid endoscope, which we commonly put in the nose to take a look around inside the nasal cavities and the sinuses. And you can see over my right shoulder, Dr. Collins is taking a look. And as I went through these pictures, I thought, you know, Dr. Collins, he's really, he, and he certainly is very concerned about the animals. And then when you look at this, I think he's more concerned about what I'm doing to his priceless gorilla. And appropriately so, it is these gorillas are amazing creatures and, and this is not something normally done. Um, but I'm thankful for his trust to allow me to examine him because it taught me some important lessons that later play out and I'll explain shortly. I was able to get a culture from this that uh, did show E. coli and, and gave us an idea of what best to treat him with. Uh, the CT scan was obtained and it shows his sinuses. This is a coronal CT scan that shows his maxillary sinuses right behind the cheekbones and frontal sinuses, kind of right in the forehead area. And if we compare that uh, to another shot that shows this deep frontal bar across the gorilla, and that's kind of what gives them that stern look. Then we compare it with humans, and this is a human sinus CT scan with opacification or disease within the frontal sinuses. And if we go a little bit further back or posterior, we'll see the ethmoid sinuses in the gorilla. And then further back are the sphenoid sinuses, right smack in the middle of the head. It's really interesting to take a further look at this, and you see this large vertical sagittal crest that these massive muscles, uh, temporalis muscles attached to it and allow for their mastication. If you compare that to the human, you can see, and this is relatively proportional, you can see the size of our brain compared to the size of their brain, and it's quite impressive. But the neat thing is we have the same structure of sinuses. Here are the sphenoid sinuses, right here in the gorilla and over here in the humans. If we look at us uh, further back, this is Vip now, and again, he got very sick, and this shows some erosion of his skull. So there's areas where the sinus infection, or at this point, we were actually worried about a tumor, had started to eat through the maxillary sinuses into the soft tissues of the face. So he was getting progressively sick despite outstanding medical care. This is a picture of Kiki, a gorilla that uh, passed away at the zoo several years ago, and we used it to help learn the anatomy. When you look at a heads-on view and compare it to a human skull, it's fascinating, the similarities you see here. We both have inferior turbinates. These are long tube-like structures that warm and humidify the air. And we even have deviated septums or twisted septums, just like gorillas do. So I thought that was fascinating. And the size proportions are fairly similar. After the CT scan, we started the antibiotics, he continued to get worse, and then the decision was made when he became pretty critical, uh, really cut back on his eating and his interactions with the other gorillas. The decision was made that we had to operate. And this is the operating room at the Woodland Park Zoo. It's an OR just like here at the UW Medical Center. The only difference is it's not supplied with high-tech sinus endoscopy instruments that we use. So through very generous corporate donations, uh, we could not have done this without these corporations, and there is a definite link between us and these industries that support education for us and education for other surgeons. And that's important because there was another sinus course going on in Seattle this weekend, and we were able to use those instruments on VIP because we can use cadaver instruments, which are just as high quality, high tech, on animals, but we cannot use human equipment on animals because of the risk of zoonoses and then use that the equipment back on humans. So uh, we were able to do the surgery. Uh, one of the fun things is I use something called image guidance, which is just like the GPS for your car. I load the CAT scan into a special machine in my operating room, and it tracks where the tip of my instrument is inside the head at all times. This is something I do fairly routinely in humans. I've never operated on a gorilla before. As far as we know, no one has ever operated on a gorilla sinus before. And so switching species, this is a critical piece of information that I needed to do a safer surgery. So we cha uh, changed the OR into this high-tech endoscopy suite. And this is Dr. Helmick. She has a laryngoscope in her left hand, and in her right hand, she's using a endotracheal tube to intubate VIP, and that's to put a breathing tube in. And Dr. Collins' is back is to us. Harmony, the vet tech, is right behind her, and she delivered uh, the anesthesia along with Dr. Helmick during the surgery. So here's a fun challenge. When I was at the CT scan, I was trying to put my rigid instrument inside his nose. 
And it's tough because his nose is very floppy. And as you can see from this video, you can literally stretch his nose about two inches up and down, up and down. And that was important to know ahead of time so that I could use some special tubes called the spyway to help protect his nostrils. We set up for the surgery, just like every surgery I do here at UW Medical Center. And it looks exactly like you would see in the ORs down on the second floor here. The only difference is when you look further down, you see things like gorilla feet <laughs> and gorilla hands. And what this picture can't show is the gorilla smell. That <laughs> is impressive. Um, it, it's a very almost acidic, skunk-like, apocrine smell that you will never forget. Um, I don't know if it's an attractant to female gorillas or if it's used as a warning mechanism, uh, but I don't think there's any way a VIP could sneak up on you in, in the wild. And I don't think he would ever want to sneak up on you either. I, he's that type of guy that would just come and say hi. Uh, Dr. Collins was there throughout the entire surgery and uh, so much concerned with um, the health of, Z of VIP and we were in constant communication throughout the surgery explaining what each other was doing from a, the side of giving the general anesthesia, keeping him asleep, and then my surgical plan. This is a, a couple uh, 30 seconds of video from in surgery and so if your stomach's a little queasy you might not want to look. It's not that bad though but I'm biased, this is what I do every day. Uh, so this is looking at setting up the image guidance system, that's VIP on his back, and this is what it looks like looking through an endoscope. So I'm holding a camera in my left hand, and I'm looking at a TV screen, seeing exactly what you see, and this is the thick infection inside VIP's sinuses that I'm cleaning out with suction and different instruments. This is the spyway to protect his nostrils, and he's very inflamed. This is a very challenging surgery compared to most sinus surgeries I do. He had a lot of polyps or these growths in the back related to the inflammation, and he hadn't taken a breath through his nose in several months because of the polyps. Once those were taken out, I could get to the back of his throat and his airway was now intact. This is now over on the right side, and I'm pointing to his middle turbinate. He had polyps, just like humans can have polyps from time to time, and this is removing the polyp. And surgery went very well and according to plan, and then there was a point in time where Dr. Helmick said, we're gonna have to lighten him up now and you can see his nostrils flaring. And that's when I knew it was time to get out of there. <laughs> Quickly. So I put in this, uh, this nice new uh, steroid releasing stent and it delivered steroids to decrease the inflammation right to that tissue. I did that on both sides. And then at the end, this is him All as right, he's... Uh, that, that's uh, the audio, I uh, forgot that was on it. And kind of just parting ways with him and this is... Uh, the whole gorilla team waiting out in the, in the foyer, uh, waiting for VIP to come out. And just the caring nature of the gorilla keepers, it's, it's, it's exactly the same as when you go to the waiting room after surgery and you talk to a family. Seeing their eyes, they uh, were clearly in a lot of anticipation for his surgery. He did very well uh, waking up from anesthesia, a, a tough thing to do for a gorilla. And these are the kind of signs you see when you go to the gorilla house behind the scenes that, uh, again, <laughs> increase my heart rate a little bit. Um, this is the backside of the gorilla house. And post-op day one, he was doing great. His facial swelling had dramatically improved. Uh, he was eating. No, this is not me hand feeding him grapes. <laughs> uh, I did hand feed him longer fruit and vegetables, but not the, not the, not the little ones. This is him walking around and, and just very, very pleased with how he's doing right now. So we're kind of high-fiving each other and, and feeling good about things. And then post-operative day three, I get a call from Dr. Helmick. Something's wrong. Vip's not doing well. And his facial swelling had dramatically came back. He started to develop purulent drainage from a fistula that developed in his neck as well as from his eye socket. And it was quite an impressive infection. When the culture and sensitivity results came back, it showed that there was a different antibiotic that might be better, and so we put him on that antibiotic in consultation with, this is Dr. Collins and Dr. Helmick discussing it. And it, what I really appreciate is they took time to ask me what I thought as well, and it, it, and it truly was just this wonderful, not only friendship, but, but teamwork that developed from this. Um, the gorilla keepers hand-fed him for days, uh, gave him drink, the animal health team gave him intramuscular antibiotics to keep him going because he wasn't eating or drinking at this point in time. 
This is a picture of him, and, and just to show how severe his infection was, draining out of his right eye socket. And what would a gorilla do? <laughs> That's what VIP does. So this, the upside of him fistulizing this soft tissue infection that had spread out of his sinuses is that he got better. And from a human surgeon standpoint, I was ready to rush back to the operating room and clean it out. And Dr. Collins, with his wisdom and his understanding of gorilla physiology, they have such, he, he educated me, they have such amazing immune systems to survive. He said, just let's be patient and see how he does. And sure enough, he did great. The fistula uh, started to close up. He um, made dramatic improvement in his eating and behavior. And this is the fistula in his neck a few days after it opened up. And then this is about two weeks later. And it just closed up on his own. About post-op day five, I was on vacation this week, uh, the first day that I did surgery, and then was on vacation. And I was scheduled to go check on VIP with Dr. Collins. Uh, but I was out horseback riding with my family for a vacation thing, and I didn't have time to go home and change, and so I came to the zoo, parked, and, and went in my horse clothes and went to check on VIP. And that's important, I think, because when I went in to see VIP, again, he had been pretty sick. He ran up to the cage and pounded on the cage, which is what he did before surgery, and I was very relieved that he was showing emotion and kind of excitement. And then he threw a bunch of straw at me, and I started to laugh, and I said, hey, Vip, nice to see you, too. And then instantly, I was covered with hot, sticky gorilla poop. <laughs> so this is how Vip thanked his sinus surgeon. <laughs> and that was the end of the visit. <laughs> so after this, I, I wipe off, and then I head back to the car where my wife and two kids were waiting for me. And I said, does anything smell funny? <laughs> and my wife says, no, but you have something in your ear. <laughs> and I had missed a spot. So uh, that was really the last of the bad side of VIP. And this is two weeks later. He's eating. His facial edema had gone down. And he was doing really, really well. Um, about, uh, oh, and also during this time, I, again, I visited him all the time. Not to check on him that like, I was really doing anything, but I had formed such a bond with Dr. Collins, the animal health team, the gorilla keepers, and VIP. I just liked going there. And I got to do things like feed him monkey chow, which is these little nuggets here, and then organic fruits and vegetables. Um, and this is a picture that the zoo took uh, probably about six weeks, I believe, or so afterwards. Uh, the purulence had drained, and then he had went back to uh, being outside in his normal exhibit at the zoo. He had a fractured canine, and this happened in an altercation. And all along, the animal health care team was planning on taking him back to the, the operating room for a general anesthesia so the oral surgeons could take a look at him. And I wanted to take a second look. This is something we often do in clinic in human patients after sinus surgery. I numb up the nose with some spray and slide an endoscope in and clean out some of the residual infection and, and some of the residual crusting that might be present. VIP wasn't going to hold still for me, and I wasn't going to try. So, when he was going back under general anesthesia, that gave us an opportunity to check things out. The uh, photo on the right shows his fractured lower canine. And uh, this is a picture of the oral surgeons taking a look at him. Dr. Collins is there, as always. And then intraoperatively, we're just going to take a quick look into his left nostril. Again, this was the more diseased, nost or more diseased sinus. And you can see there still is some sinus infection present. It's uh, not nearly as bad as what it was, and it cleaned out nice and easily. On the right side, it looks healthy. This is great. This is sucking out gorilla snot. So not too many people get to do that. It was a good day for me. Uh, and then we finished things up with his surgery there. In November, he was doing fantastic. He was walking around outside and behaving like VIP. And then uh, about a few days before Christmas, I got one of the best Christmas presents ever. I got this email from Dr. Collins, and this, is, this picture is important because this is Vip hanging out in his, uh, in his sleeping quarters in the gorilla house, and there are fire hoses hanging from the ceiling. And Dr. Collins says in his email, Vip was having gorilla-friendly relations with one of the females while climbing on the fire hoses last week. The aerial copulations on the suspended fire hose is a great indicator of how well he is feeling this day's 
doesn't get any better for a male gorilla. So that made my day. And uh, my day and VIP's day couldn't have been possible without a ton of people who donated their time. This was all donation from everybody, including my surgical team, one of my resident surgeons, Dr. Bake, who came and assisted me, my circulating nurse, my scrub tech, and many people here at UW Medicine, including Dean Ramsey, who helped out. Uh, the animal health team, led by Dr. Collins, also known as Vet One at the Woodland Park Zoo, is absolutely fantastic. The gorilla keepers, they practically live there. They consider the gorillas their family, and taking care of them is just like taking care of humans. It was truly an amazing experience. Um, Dr. Liddell started this all by being able to get a good picture of a CT scan. I don't think a CT scan of a gorilla has ever been done, and now we're documenting that so others can learn from it. Um, a lot of people contributed to the pictures I showed, and then again, the corporate uh, sponsorship couldn't have uh, done the surgery without it. So. I want to thank you for your time, and, and the final thing, when I give this talk to other ear, nose, and throat surgeons, I say, go volunteer. Give your time at the zoo, and some have, um, but what you can do, you can go to the zoo, visit VIP. There's often a volunteer out there, and you can ask them to point out VIP. He's pretty shy and hangs out in back or along the side, um, but they'll show you him. And, and then if there is an opportunity to donate to the zoo, this is uh, Laura Baumwalls, uh, and she's here today. Laura, can you raise your hand just to say hi? Uh, this is her contact information if uh, you're curious. But what I've learned from working with the animals is all the conservation they do, not just to preserve the gorillas and all the animals at the zoo, but the incredible outreach that they do throughout the world from uh, buying and preserving natural habitat to sponsoring scientists to go out into the field and study these magnificent animals to help learn more about them and us in the long run. Uh, so it's been a life-changing opportunity for me. I'm now back to doing just human sinus work. Um, and I got to say, it's a little boring compared to gorilla sinus surgery. Um, but we'll see what happens in the future. So I'd like now to introduce uh, one of my very good friends, Dr. Darren Collins, who is Vet One at Woodland Park Zoo. Dr. Collins. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Hi, everybody. I'm Darren. I'm Vet One, as Dr. Davis said. I'd like to thank Dr. Davis and his team of really compassionate, caring, and expert um, technicians and doctors who came and helped our patient. And thank you to the University of Washington for loaning Dr. Davis to us for what ended up being a happy ending but it was a nightmare the whole way through it. And if you can imagine being responsible for immobilizing a 450-pound gorilla and keeping him alive, keeping him alive in the back of a truck, going to Northgate Mall and back, and, <laughs> and then again at the zoo so this guy could stick all these instruments into his head and do it for like two hours, and, and then he wants to do it again. You know, I was exhausted. All of us were exhausted, but VIP hung in there, and a, a true testimony to the, the spirit and the, the nature of working with wild animals who are amazing patients. I have the opportunity and the privilege of being one of their veterinarians. <clears throat> but I can't do it all. We can't do it all. We have to call in consultants on a routine basis. I talk to a veterinary cardiologist to come and ultrasound a penguin next week. So there's a limit to what we can do, and we can't do a complete job without our, our consultants and their expertise. And um, when the time came for a bill from Dr. Davis, there was no bill. So he did this all free of charge, and we couldn't have done it without him. As you can imagine, you heard Dr. Davis say he wasn't breathing through his nose. This case, in the wild or without intervention, such as what we were able to provide, would have ended his life. And ended, I see it also, as his opportunity to 
extend his species. He is a real stud gorilla. <laughs> he is a gorilla's gorilla. He really serves a purpose where others fall short. And <laughs> we, as much as anything, we kept him reproductively active. And when he was copulating on the fire hoses, I told the keeper, I said, go scrape some of that sperm off the fire hose because we really want to know if this has impacted his fertility or not. But he uh, continues to breed his females, and someday he might have an offspring, and if it's a male, we might call it Greg or Gregor. Or <laughs> so, something like that. So if you're not a member of the zoo, I uh, encourage you to become a member. Come often, bring your friends, and you can actually, on your smartphone, download a Zubiquity or a One Health uh, type tour, and you can uh, hear the stories of some of the other animal patients that really remind you that we are an animal also. So thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you, University of Washington, and thank you for your attention.